one, this is Yon at Viking Aircraft Engines. I'm sitting here in between some samples of our largest engine, the 195 horsepower gasoline direct injected or GDI turbocharged engine that we sell. This video is going to be particularly about this engine. We're going to talk a little bit about the performance of the engine. We're going to talk about the details of the engine and the suitability of this engine to go into particular airplanes. But I'm going to lean towards talking about what, what we have the most experience with, which would be in our own personal Super Duty by Zenith and the 850 hours that we've accumulated during the last three, three and a half years in that airplane using this engine. So let's get started. So what exactly is a 195 horsepower Viking engine? Well, initially, the engine is derived from, like all of our engines, from Honda cars. We believe in taking the Honda car engine and converting it, because it's a good quality engine, to an airplane engine. So this particular engine comes out of the 2020-2021 Honda Accord car. We use that because we believe that using older technology engines is kind of going backwards. Uh, we always want to be at the end of the production cycle as far as the latest and greatest in technology, and that's what we have here. So we're going to describe a little bit about exactly what is inside these engines, why we chose it, and how we utilize this engine in our own particular airplane, which is a Zenith Super Duty. So why do we use car engines as airplane engines here at Viking? It's been a something that people have done for many years, and I've been doing it for many years, and it's getting traction. What that means is more and more people are seeing that it's a viable thing, and in fact it's become uh, extremely popular in some circles of aviation, and particularly in the experimental home build area where reliable, lesser expensive engines are desirable. Now the Honda Accord, of course, uh, some might tell you that it drives down the road and it's not producing a whole lot of power, so how is that gonna be good in an airplane? Well, the good thing about Honda is, first of all, we know that they make good engines. They pride themselves in making good engines and they pride themselves in making engines for everything. The other thing is they use their car engines in their outboard motors. So when you go to their outboard motor website and you look at the performance of some of those outboard motors, you'll see that they run those engines at even higher RPM than they do in the car and they run them at a uh, very steady state output, very similar to what we do in an airplane. So we start out with the latest in technology. We think that's important. You know, we don't want to go back like 15 years and and uh, bring back an engine that doesn't exist right now. So if you were to go, for instance, to a Honda dealership, you would find the engines that we are producing and flying in our own airplane right now. So this particular engine is a Honda Accord GDI, or gasoline direct injected turbocharged uh, engine that you would find if you went to the showroom, a Honda car showroom, or an outboard motor showroom, you would find this engine under the hood of that car or in that outboard motor. And we think that's important because we don't actually go through or open up or change anything inside the engine. We feel very strongly that the engine was put together by a robotic assembly line and also by people here in the US in Ohio. They make these engines up there. And we feel like once that's been done, we cannot repeat what has been done by taking the engine apart. So we source engines that are 100% together and we use those engines in the airplane and we focus then on the external parts that transforms the engine from a car engine into an airplane engine and we're going to go through that in more detail. Engines like all these engines I'm sitting with right here now are Honda Accord engines. They're 2020 Honda Accord engines. They're direct injection, or what they call GDI, gasoline direct injected engines. They are turbocharged, which is what the automotive industry is now leaning towards. They're using this term downsizing, which means the engines are getting smaller, but 
they're direct injected and they have turbochargers, so they produce more power than they ever did in the past. I'm sure you've heard the term that how, much, how can we get this kind of power out of a small displacement engine? It used to be a 1.5 liter engine. Uh, it's an 80 horsepower engine, whatever. And now a 1.5 liter engine is 200 horsepower with direct injection and all the stuff that goes with that that we're gonna talk about. Uh, so it's exciting times. Uh, I think it's also very exciting because we're right at the tipping point where our engines are becoming extremely popular as a mainstream engine for the home builder. Uh, and that we have 850 hours in our own airplane, which by the way is just this engine. We have customers that this year that flew 300 hours uh, out of the 130 engine that we built. Uh, other customer flew 160 hours and it's just like incredible amount of numbers of hours that are being put on these engines in a single year and it's a whole different thing than in the past where auto conversion engines were tinkering engines and you stayed around the home airport and you didn't go anywhere and and now it's like between the videos of how to install it and all the information that's available and the technology of the engines and the perfection of the reduction drives and all this kind of stuff the engines are going a long way. You you put it in, you follow the procedure, you jump in your plane, you do some testing around your local airport. But after that, you're going across the country with these engines, without any tinkering, without any trouble. Just follow what we have learned through all the things that we have done up through the years and that uh, our camaraderie with our customers and sharing information on social media, on our platforms, on our, uh, Facebook, uh, Viking, how to do stuff, and it's just a wonderful thing that we've come to, and uh, being part of it, this is the perfect time to be part of such a group, because you're going away from air-cooled, you're going away from old-fashioned stuff, you're going away from all these American companies that unfortunately went overseas, and you're going with uh, engines that are built in Ohio, the United States, you're going with a family-owned business that are striving to make your airplane a success. We fly the engines ourselves every day. We go to the trade shows. We go to the Zenith fly-ins. We participate in the stall competitions and we're having a ball. And our customers are doing the same. And we're standing behind every single customer with the support that I give in my design and my flight testing and things that Alyssa is doing through a wonderful job dealing with our customers and friends making arrangements to go and see them, uh, doing first flights, it's just a wonderful thing. I hope you've enjoyed seeing what we've done lately and how we're able to take this 2021, 2020, 2021 technology of showroom engines from Honda and putting them in all kinds of airplanes. So now a related question of course is why? Why use car engines as an airplane engine? Well, because they make a lot of cars. <laughs> they have a lot of money for cars. They invest a lot of money in research and development for car engines. Car engines are, they're, they're made by the millions, by the hundreds of millions. Airplane engines are made by, you know, two, three hundred a year of this brand, thousand of this brand, all that. It's, it's a totally different thing. You're looking at a, an IO 360 Continental crankshaft, a new one, $16,000. You get a crankshaft that's further, that's more advanced, uh, made by Honda, same kind of technology they use in their Formula One racing uh, cars. It's uh, $560. Because, why? Why? Because they make a ton of them. That's why we do car engines, because they make a ton of parts. You can go and get a starter on the weekend, you can get a oil pack, you can get spark plugs, you can get everything like anywhere in the country. There are Honda dealers everywhere. You can order online Honda parts. They'll be there the next day. Uh, you can get aftermarket parts if you if you need in a pinch at a local auto parts store. Uh, it's a whole different thing. So looking at where we're at, 2020, uh, this is, this is the time, I mean, this is, now is the time to make a decision. You know, go with a, 
air-cooled or a low-volume engine and pay all this money, or join in in a camaraderie of people that are paying much less than half for their entire engine package, engine, propeller, cowling, batteries, uh, cooling system, uh, all, your, all your cabling, uh, every nut and bolt, propeller, spinner, all the things that you need to get flying on your airplane kit for less than what just an engine costs from a traditional aircraft engine company. So what is a traditional aircraft engine company? Well, it's, you know, uh, Continental, it's uh, like Homey. Um, both of them kind of heavy for the kind of airplanes that we deal with as far as Zenit and any of the light sport aircraft. So they kind of fall to the wayside there. Uh, you might be able to use a Continental engine in your, uh, let's say your Zenit Super Duty, which is what we have, but it's, it's expensive. You may be looking at you're getting close to fifty thousand. By the time you get the engine, a new engine, uh, your firewall forward, your propeller, all the nuts and bolts, all the extras, and all the stuff that's not even included in your firewall forward package, uh, lack of videos of how to install it and all that. And then you you get a, a mass produced Honda engine and you're down around eighteen for the engine. And by the time you get every nut and bolt and a propeller, you're touching 30,000. Yeah. All right, so what exactly do we do at Viking? I say we have the modern Honda engines, but we must have more than that, and we do. So we pride ourselves in having the engine untouched from the assembly line, where it was put together by the robotic team of Honda. Most of the engines are built in Anaheim, Ohio, United States. Forgings, crankshafts, the whole assembly, uh, the whole engine. So what do we do once we get one of these engines? Well, we make sure that the engine stays as true to the Honda engine, the way it was meant to be, and the way it was meant to run in the car, and how it was meant to run in the outboard motor, which Honda also uses the same engines in the cars as they do in their outboard motors, which also proves the longevity and the high RPM and running uh, constant output and all that because they, they run it in the car, which doesn't require as much power, but they also run it in the outboard motor, which does require a lot of power, continuous power. Once we have that engine, we look at it, and that is my job, and analyze how do we make it as similar as in the car, yet reliable in an airplane. Obviously, we can't use the same transmission, so we design a gearbox that drives a propeller. So the, the gearbox has to be able to carry the loads of the propeller independently from the engine and from the crankshaft of the engine, because contrary to a light homing or Connell engine that has a lot of extra bearings up front and is able to handle a propeller at the end of the crankshaft, the Honda engine is not designed for that. It is designed to turn. It rotates and it drives a flywheel and it drives a transmission in a car or in the outboard motor and that's how it goes. Now, what we do is we make a we design a gearbox, which is what you're seeing right here, that is able to separate those two. Meaning the engine is still just like in the car, it drives the input gear of the gearbox, which drives an idle gear, which drives a propeller gear. The propeller gear is supported with plenty of bearings to handle any kind of propeller load that we have tested. The input gear is driven directly off of the crankshaft through a flex coupling. It's a fail-safe design, and it is able to withstand, uh, it doesn't put any load on the bearings in the crankshaft of the engine, and it is able to take the pulses from the four-cylinder engine firing independent cylinders bringing that into a gearbox and powering a propeller. So the engine powers the gearbox. It doesn't know anything about side loading or anything like that because the gearbox handles that. And the same with the propeller. The propeller is loads the centrifugal forces, the uh, push and pull of the propeller, 
those are handled by the gearbox, and they're handled by the bearings of the gearbox, and the prop shaft of the gearbox, and the lugs that are on part of the gearbox. So that is a major thing that we do, it's a major thing that we have designed, that we have tested, that we fly hour after hour, and that we have upgraded and made better as time goes by. Uh, and this is not something that you can just kind of like cobble together a belt drive or anything and, and throw it on an engine and think you have a reliable auto conversion. This is where 90% of the testing goes, is in the hundreds and hundreds of hours of flying to make sure that the gearbox, which converts the engine the way it runs in the car, to being able to drive a large propeller in an airplane continuously for hour after hour after hour, feeling confident sitting in your airplane, flying over woods, flying over the oceans, flying over the mountains. And that's the difference between like something that's home brewed and not tested, or built by someone that supposedly has the know-how but doesn't really fly or test. You need something where there's a customer base and a company that's willing to go and actually fly these and have several years of flying that flies to all the air shows that does high output soul competitions, uh, basically that is proud of flying and building hours on their own engines. That's super important. And that kind of leads me to like when you want to look for an engine for your own project, um, don't listen to me, don't listen to Alyssa, but listen to the customers, you know. Get three, four, five, six people that you can call, visit, fly with, and get real information about your airplane using a Viking engine in that airplane. Running down the list of what we actually do. What is a day like at Viking? Well, we build wirelands. Wirelands. So, is that a big deal? Well kind of a big deal because these are modern engines, which means they use a digital ECU, electronic control unit that powers the engine, runs the engine, or it doesn't really power the engine, but it controls what goes on in the engine. There are sensors on the engine that are then fed back to the ECU. The ECU decides how much fuel and how much ignition timing to allow and that's what makes the engine run. It has inputs such as RPM, manifold pressure, temperature of the air that's entering the engine, coolant temperature, basically the block temperature of the engine, so forth and so on. And between these inputs that are being then fed to the ECU, it makes a decision of what to do and how to operate the engine. So, Back to the wireless, why is that so important? Well, it's important because that's what sends these signals through wires. So we take great care in making sure that the, we know that the automotive engine is really highly advanced and we know that they do a good job building the engine, building the bearings, building the mechanical parts of the engine. We also know that there's a time limit or a lifespan on some components on anything. One thing being the harness that's on an automotive engine, it's usually figured by the designers that the wire loom will last 20, 25 years. What happens is that slowly uh, corrosion takes place in the copper wire loom and wires are oversized for that purpose to be able to carry the currents of the various things like the coils and fire the spark plugs and so forth over that 20, 25 year period. Now, as an airplane engine, we don't want something that you can't really see that's getting degraded. So what we do is we make our own wire board and we do our own wire loop. Because we all know that tough cell wiring, aircraft wire, is superior to cheap copper stranded wire. So we use Tepcel or Teflon coated wire with tinned copper or multi-strand and all that, basically aircraft wire to make an uh, aircraft quality wire loom that'll run 
the sensors on the engine. Other than that, we have to focus on things like we can't have an exhaust system like we have in the car. The car has a long exhaust pipe underneath. We need to be able to keep the engine quiet, but we don't necessarily have 20, 25 feet of undercar area to do it. So we work on making an exhaust system that is tuned to the engine for an airplane. So exhaust system work and dyno work with the exhaust is quite a bit of work. We also need to cool both the gearbox, which handles the propeller loads, we talked about it, and we need to be able to cool the engine itself. It's not a liquid, it's, it is a liquid cooled engine, it's not an air cooled engine, so we're not just blowing air on the engine. That is not how it works. Now, that is how it works with the gearbox. We do have a little opening in the front of the cowling and we cool the aluminum housing because we use gear oil and the gearbox is separate from the engine as far as the cooling and the lubrication. It has its own gear oil and we cool that with air coming up right off the propeller because it just happens to be we have a giant propeller right in front of the gearbox so we might as well cool it with a little bit of air from the propeller. Now the rest of the engine is all liquid cooled. It's not like I think the road tax is like oil cooled, liquid cooled, and air cooled. Um, we don't even use an oil cooler. So this engine is only liquid cooled, meaning that it uses a liquid medium that flows through the engine, through a radiator or heat exchanger, and back to the engine, and that's how the engine is cooled. Which makes it very easy, because when you do your first flights, if you have too much cooling or not enough cooling, guess what? You only look at one place. It's not air over the cylinders or air over the, or, or liquid in the, in the heads or whatever. And it's not the oil cooler, because there is no oil cooler. It's just one thing. It's, it's, it's getting enough air through your radiator. And that's the only place you have to work on trying to get you know, enough or too much cooling. Of course, the engine's equipped with a thermostat, so too much cooling only hurts your performance. It doesn't uh, really hurt you any other way because the thermostat will keep the engine at the optimum temperature. Now, as far as what else we do at Viking, well, we make engine mounts. You know, on the back of all these engines, we have brackets that you can, you know, fabricate an engine mount with rubber cushions where it can actually be a 41 through 30 chromoly welded mount that goes through the airframe, which is very traditional in the business. And uh, as an uh, engine manufacturer, we recognize that in order for an individual to use our engine, we don't just sell you an engine. We provide all these things. We provide engine mount locations on the engine. We provide the rubber dampers. We provide a complete engine mount that goes through the firewall out of 4130 chromoly steel. We'll have it powder coated in any kind of color you want if that's a preference. Um, so the engine mounting is a big thing that we do, and it's it's critical. You know, you could be up about half an inch or down a half an inch, and, and that will like waste your day because it has to fit. It has to have the right amount of offset to get the proper torque to the propeller so that you know your rudder and everything is working the way you want when you take off. Uh, it has to have the right distance from the firewall so that your center of gravity is going to work out for you when you're all done with your airplane. So there's a lot of considerations and we do that and we test it and we supply it as a completely tested, engineered, finished package to the customer. Um, so now we're looking at like an intake system. The intake is fairly simple. Sometimes we build an intake manifold for an engine and sometimes we'll use the original Honda intake manifold. Um, we do supply you know, the proper air filtration and things like that for the engine. Other than that, it is a, an engine, and we pride ourselves in that, that sits upright, that has, you fill the oil at the top, it runs to the bottom, has an oil pan on the bottom, just like it does in the car. Uh, the reason for the three gear gearbox that you see here with a nice sight glass, you can see the oil on the side, is for that reason. We want the engine to sit upright like it does in the car, and we want, and, and the reason for the idler gear, which is the center gear, is to be able to have that distance from the input to the output. So when you put a spinner on this, a 13 inch usually, 
the engine can sit upright and you have a nice cowling line over the engine and everything fits perfectly in your airplane. So what exactly do we mean when we say, well, there's so many advantages or technologically advantages to these modern engines over quote-unquote old-fashioned airplane engines, uh, or even modern engines such as the 915 Rotax uh, engine, which we have to consider modern because it, was just, it just came out. So why are these engines more advanced than even that engine? Well, let's talk about some of the internals and some of the features of these engines. Each of the engines is gasoline direct injected, GDI. That means it's like a diesel engine. It uses a mechanical pump, which my hand is on right here, with a high pressure fuel rail out of stainless steel, quarter inch stainless steel, heavy duty stuff, that pumps the fuel up from what you supply from your tanks to over 2,000 psi and injects it into the midst of the cylinder rather than the intake manifold and then the intake valve drawing it in. So, you've heard that, well, it's not all good with GDI, gasoline direct injection, because you get intake valves that get gummed up. Well, if you've read that or our competition is telling you that that's an issue and all that, you might just forget that because that comes about because of the emissions with the engines that are on the street. If you have one of these engines in your port, you might want to, you know, be a little worried about that or do something about that or whatever. I don't even think it's an issue anymore. I think it's a couple years back, five years, ten years back. But we don't run blow-by, meaning crankcase ventilation systems, like the fumes from the crankshaft or crankcase does not run through the intake manifold and get sucked back through the intake into the engine on these engines. All airplane engines, piston-powered airplane engines, run the blow-by overboard. That's just how we do it. So without running crankcase ventilation back into the intake, there's no dirt going through the intake manifold, which means since there's no gasoline washing these intake valves like it was in the olden days when port injection was style, we don't have to worry about getting gunk built up on our intake valves. Guess what? Because there's no gunk. We don't have any gunk. We have an air filter, draws clean air into the engine, no blow-by, not an issue. So GDI, gasoline injection, in an airplane has nothing but advantages. Why is that? Direct injection allows the fuel to be in introduced to the cylinder as the piston is descending, but here's the thing, it's being injected inside the cylinder, so as the molecules are expanding, it has a cooling effect on the internals of the cylinder. So because of this, you can run more ignition timing, or more advanced ignition timing, and you can have a higher compression. Between the two, a smaller engine can make more power reliably without having any kind of knock. Now, engines have a knock sensor just in case, and the ECU controls that as well. But the important part is that a smaller engine, a lighter engine, can make more power, which is all that we want in an airplane engine. And we can do it reliably. Direct injection also allows you to have instant starting at any temperature, and all around, it's smooth running and a very fuel efficient engine while you're flying. What else we got on this engine that's a little bit high tech? Now, if we were to look at, for instance, the starter motor. Uh, I got a starter motor right here. We got a starter motor right here. I don't know if it's visible in the video, but the one thing that's unique with it, as you know, this thing that you hate about your new car where it just shuts off and restarts and shuts off and restarts at every stoplight. Well, Honda has that on these cars, so they use a helical starter ring gear. Minor, but very, very efficient as far as a quiet, very uh, fast-acting starter motor. Not like the older things. You just you hit the button and the engine's running. Minor thing, but still kind of cool. What else we got going on? Internal. 
the engine has revolutionary, in a sense, uh, cooling passages. It has a dual cooling system in the head of the engine, which is where most of the heat is being generated. It has a passage that cools the cylinder head and the exhaust because the engine has a, what's called an integral exhaust manifold. The integral exhaust manifold means you don't have four, you don't have a cast manifold on the outside of the engine. It's all cast inside the cylinder head and it's cast in aluminum. Now can you do that, you say, with that kind of temperature? Well, it's done because the coolant flows through that manifold and you're able to have an integral exhaust manifold cooled by the coolant of that's being cooled by the radiator. Now, that does pick up a little bit of heat in the cooling system, but it also has a lot of advantages. We only need a couple of extra rows of radiators to help compensate for this feature. But the nice thing about the feature is the engine will heat up very quickly. As soon as you heat it up, as soon as you start it up, the passage that goes through the head and passes through the exhaust manifold is the same passage that also goes through your heater core, which means your engine heats up quickly and your cabin heats up quickly inside the airplane when you run a heater off of that coolant passage. The other thing that they do on these engines is they actually have cooling passages between each cylinder, which is kind of unique. It's uh, something that has been done in uh, formula racing where they need it absolutely the last little bit. There are passages now between each shoulder where the uh, combustion chambers of each shoulder is being cooled by liquid. Also, each piston has an oil squirter, or actually several oil squirters, cooling the piston from below. And also, oil cooling galleys throughout the piston, which is unheard of, uh, other than in formula racing and very, very high-end expensive engines. Uh, in addition to that, the piston and the crankshaft are offset slightly to each other, so the pressure of the combustion is turning the crankshaft easier because the piston is offset slightly to the crankshaft. Another ingenuity that's in modern engines and also on this engine. The engine is also loaded with what Honda and other manufacturers refer to as friction reduction technology. Friction reduction technology has come so far that the engine, this particular engine, doesn't need an oil cooler. The oil hardly heats up at all. The pressure, oil pressure stays extremely good throughout the entire flight. Uh, the benefit of the friction reduction, of course, is that uh, the engine will idle and run for a long period of time on the ground without ever really needing any serious cooling. It's gotten to the point where there's so little internal heat buildup of these engines at idle that Honda actually had an issue where people were commuting very short distances where the engine wouldn't warm up enough and there could be an issue with dilution of the oil in the oil pan uh, from the direct injection uh, due to not having enough temperature in the engine. Now, of course, in an airplane, this has been solved by Honda through some software changes. And of course, as an airplane engine, this is not an issue. We want to have a low friction engine at all costs. Uh, and it's not an issue because we start the engine, we taxi the engine, we fly the engine. Our engines are always getting to operating temperature and then we shut down the engine. Other technologies in the engine are things like fractured connecting rods. That means that they're not bolted together with dowel pins and things like that to align them. They're actually frozen and sheared. They're forged in one piece. So there's high technology throughout the engine from one end to the other. Bearing caps are all micro grooved. Pistons have molybdenum coatings on them. Uh, meaning that when there's no oil in an engine, when it's sitting there and you're starting it after it's been parked for six months, there is no metal to metal contact anywhere. The pistons actually have dotted plastic, basically, um, uh, inserts in them that will prevent any kind of metal to metal contact. So throughout the engine, 
lots of te technology and lots of things that you might think of as being irrelevant to an airplane engine. But an airplane engine is actually no more than a hard working engine. And the more technology that's reliable uh, that you can have, the better. Some might say, well, I started up, it runs at the same temperature from when I, when I started up until when I went. Well, it's, it's, it's not really true, it's an illusion. <laughs> the, the engines uh, have to have maximum, if not more than maximum power for takeoff. We want everything we can get out of the engine for takeoff and climbing. And then we want an extremely efficient, uh, long duration cruise out of the engine. And we want the engine to operate properly when we go to idle and coast and descend for maybe a half an hour at the other destination. And we want it to start easy and we want it to idle good. So the engines have a harder life than you think uh, as an airplane engine, but it's all built into these engines more so than any engine because of the fact that everything is variable and can be programmed to be optimized to the particular uh, phase of either startup, idle, taxi, departure, climb, cruise, descent, and taxi shutdown at the other end. I kind of started this video saying that I thought, you know, this is a, a fun time for everybody to get involved with what we're doing. And it's kind of a bold statement, you know. I've been doing this since I was in college. I'm, uh, I'm in my 50s now. And uh, I think that's true. I've seen it. I've seen it now working with my wife, Alyssa. I've seen that uh, people are excited about this. You know, there are, there are even people that have thought they'd made up their mind about going with... Uh, something that a kit manufacturer had suggested to them was the right engine. We have the firewall forward, we have, this is the plane, this is the engine that was in our airplane when we designed the airplane kit and all that. And uh, even those people are starting to think a little bit about, it's tough, it's tough to get these air-cooled new engines. Uh, it's, uh, it's not exciting. Um, an 0360 like homing, uh, it's, it's not an exciting engine. <laughs> These are exciting engines. Is it scary to go with a car conversion? Maybe, but it, it's less and less scary the more you research, because if you look at our website, you see a map. It has several hundred people all over the country, all over the world that are flying it. Let's say you're building a particular airplane like we have, a Zenith Super Duty, and, and we do a lot with the Zenith airplanes. And uh, uh, I don't want to be like only Super Duty with that engine under the bike as well. Once you find out and, and, you, and you join the, the, the groups and stuff, and it's like, well, it, Viking had uh, Zenith Super Duty flying almost at the same time or a couple of months after the factory had one. The factory was here looking at our airplane. Um, they're very supportive of what we do. They know we have firewall forward. They know we have every bit and piece for the airplane, for the engine. We know we have videos showing. We have more videos than than the original prototype by by the factory showing every nut and bolt of how to put it together. And uh, over 20 people. I don't know how many super duties are have been sold, but I know over 20 people are already getting their engine, or have gotten their engine for the Super Duty using one of these. And, and that's just people that are like, already received it. Their order book is much longer than that. And it's exciting because it seems like everybody we see on, on Facebook and stuff that's building a Super Duty uh, car, a couple of people are using a Viking engine. And when somebody talks about a Viking engine now, it's uh, yeah, you should use the biking engine. I saw them in the stall competition. That's that's a good engine. And we don't have any naysayers. We have we have a few. You know, they they're just always going to be there. <laughs> but uh, there was just a video being posted the other day, and it was it's just wonderful. You know, people are like, yeah, that's what we need to do. We're not going to get gouged anymore. We're not going to pay thirty five thousand dollars for for an engine that was designed in the thirties, and 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 not be able to talk to the company directly. 
We're going to deal with our family-owned business. We're going to uh, deal with the guy. Uh, we're going to deal with Jan and Alyssa, but we're also going to deal with those other 20, 30, 40 guys that are doing the same airplane with the same firewall forward that I'm doing. I'm going to be part of that group instead of trying to get like Bowman or Connell on the phone or anything like that. So, yeah, good times. You know, it's, it's fun. I think that, uh, you know, flipping this now, which I was saying at, at this, this stage uh, of the auto conversion movement, is perfect because we could go from like um, everyone working on their own and working with us here at the factory to a huge camaraderie of people that share information. Oh, yes, I, I, sent, I got my oil report back today on my on my Blackstone report, on my gearbox, and I got it back on my engine oil, and, and I got these numbers, and I'm using cash oil, this and that, and, and I got zero twenty synthetic in it, and, and this is what my numbers were saying, and this is what my compression readings were this year, and, and just, you know, sharing this information and being part of a group like that, doing the same thing is what it's all about. And then obviously get togethers, uh, like homecoming up in Zenith using, um, the, the, the Addison venue, and then of course uh, Viking has a thing here every year for the, uh, uh, we do the uh, engine workshop here, and then just participating maybe in soul competition, which is becoming very popular right now. You have all kinds of opportunity with these kind of engines, especially with the turbocharged engines, to have fun doing large, long propellers, and, and, uh, and of course we have all the variable pitch propellers. Uh, these these gearboxes have hollow shafts, and we have our own invention when it comes to a drive system, a linear actuator on the side of the engine, powering our shaft through the gearbox, which operates a super modern Duke propeller uh, with three blades, five blades, and it's it's just it's just something that you can add to your engine down the line. Either you just add it right off the bat, and and bite the bullet and pay a little extra money for that. Or you can just get a gearbox that has a hollow shaft and add a variable pitch propeller anytime in the future. And of course, having the ability to have an engine, and we talked about the internals of the engine a second ago, and understanding the whole thing about that because it's a computer controlled or, or yeah, controlled engine, you can leave the throttle wide open. People have a concept of that the throttle actually controls the power. When you get a GDI turbocharged control, digitally controlled, a big wastegate engine, you want to leave the throttle wide open if you have a variable pitch propeller. That doesn't mean you have 100% power. It just means that there's no obstruction in the intake manifold. The turbocharger is allowed to push air in through the intake freely and the Propeller pitch is actually controlling the RPM, which is a function of the actual power that's being produced. So when you're at 600 feet flying over the marsh or over the, the, the tundra or, uh, or the, the, the desert or wherever you live, and you have full throttle, but you have maximum pitch in the propeller, blades are as coarse as they can be, you have such a such an efficient engine, such a low propeller RPM, such low noise, such low fuel flow, such low vibration. It is a whole different thing. And the people that come here and actually get a test ride and experience it, they just like, wow. They, can just, they really just can't believe it. Uh, they don't understand up until the point of getting the test ride what it's like and how far it's come between technology in the engine, the technology in the propellers, and the testing and the implementation that we have done up through the years. So what exactly does it mean if you get a, an engine from Viking? Are you going to be on your own? Are you going to be lost? Are you going to know what to do? Are you going to need professional help? Well, I think you're going to be fine. We have a video on how to do your electrical system. We have a video and all the parts to do your fuel system. Um, we show you how to hoist the engine, bolt the engine to the firewall, 
hook up the throttle cable, hook up dual throttles if you want it. We have the parts for that. So you're definitely not on your own and you have all the help that you would want. If you're not a big person on social media, uh, things like that, there's videos on the website that show you everything of how to do it and every single part. We're not talking about, you know, we have, like I heard somebody say, uh, actually a competitor say, uh, yeah, you need an engine and an engine mount, a cowling, and an engine and a propeller. And we have that available. Well, to me, that, to me that's cool, but you'd be, you'd be so lost unless you've installed airplane engines before. How about your batteries? How about your battery cables, your terminals, your crimp tools to put that together? Your firewall pass-throughs, uh, the information that you need about uh, the rubber couplings and the washers that go with that, the, how to put the bolts through the firewall, the, the hints and tricks of the trade of how to make it easy. Uh, there, there's so much more to it than just the engine mount, the cowling, the propeller, and the engine. Um, so you want you want to be part of a a group that has all this available. Now, of course, we can come out and install the engine for you, but we've also done it a, like a whole bunch of times, and we've recorded all that on on video, so you can follow along every single wire. Take this wire and put it here. Take this wire and put it there. And you can always, you know, do your own thing. The only requirements we have is like some basic ones, you know, use our fuel system, use the kind of uh, things that we know that have been working for years and years and years. You know, don't have too many wires between your battery and the computer that runs the engine, things like that. But that's all explained and it's shown to you for you to be safe and for you to have the um, advantage of being able to implement a system that we have seen work, that we have seen fail, that we have improved upon, made differently, and through this process made a, a, what we now consider a, a bulletproof system if it's done the way we, we specify. So I think that the the firewall forward package should be very, you should be very cautious about buying an engine if there's just a mount and a cowling and a propeller and an engine. Because there's a lot of things that tie that, <laughs> tie that stuff together. There really is, both when it comes to information and when it comes to parts. Now, Performance. What does performance mean? To me, performance means a lot of things. But let's cover what you might think performance means, or what people think it means if they're like comparing one airplane to another. It might be like maximum speed. How fast can we get off the ground? Type of thing. And as far as the ultimate performance, like brute power, we have it. We have it more than anything. We have. If there's no engine like this that can have this kind of performance. Uh, you can have 20 pounds of boost and you can jump up in the air in, in less than 100 feet uh, with these types of, uh, with the power and, uh, of these engines. So brute power performance is definitely there. So you, you don't have to really worry about that. Now what else is there in performance? Um, maybe I should cover that uh, before I jump off like the brute power part. And that is, of course, if you're building any kind of a stall, short takeoff, and landing type of airplane, you want a big propeller. The more propeller you have, the larger propeller, the more diameter, the more that air is going to flow over the tail and the wings of the airplane, and the more of a disc you have moving air back, which is going to help you levitate off the ground for a short takeoff and landing type of airplane. Now, to get a large propeller, you need a gear to I don't care if it's a rope tax or a biking or whatever, but you need a geared in if it's a short take on the landing type of airplane. Um, you can get away with a direct drive if it's a tiny little airplane, super lightweight, you fly by yourself and all that. But try to put three people in it, full fuel, uh, and uh, some real conditions, no headwind, uh, rough terrain, uh, and 
then find clear some trees. You need a big propeller and lots of torque and uh, a geared engine. Now, as far as any kind of other performance, I actually look at performance in a lot of different ways when I fly. One big one is how quiet it is. You know, nobody wants to go fly in a blaring airplane with uh, lots of exhaust noise and uh, high RPM speeds that are noisy and all that. Geared engines, again, happens to be with these turbocharged engines, it's amazing because the turbocharger, when the, en when the engine is designed to like run on the turbocharger, meaning that it, it's using boost most of the time while it's producing its power, the nice thing about that is that it's also chopping up all the little pulses coming out of the exhaust that runs the turbine, and it makes it very, very quiet. Hence, no muffler on the turbo engine, just a big shiny exhaust pipe, and it is the quietest engine that we have. It's the turbo GDI 195. Now, we also have other engines, uh, like the 130 that's muffled, and it's okay, because it's geared and the engine turns slowly. But uh, the turbocharger also does a really good noise uh, reduction method. Other than that, uh, other than quiet fuel efficiency, you know, getting like 32 miles to the gallon in an airplane is important. If you can do that, rather than like 20 miles to the gallon, it makes a huge difference in an airplane more so than in a car because you actually have to carry this fuel, it's weight. So, and also the time that it takes to land and refuel and all that on a cross-country trip, uh, you're better off with a system that is sufficient, even if you, even if money is no object and you just throw gas at it, you can, uh, you obviously more, uh, you have better performance over your airplane if you can extend your flights, use less fuel, and it's more quiet and so forth and so on. So those are the, the performance things that are important to me, in addition to other things like operating costs, which of course is the lowest it can be with a automobile derived engines and, and such. Let's take a look at these engines a little bit. We talked about the gearbox. The gearbox was designed with longevity in mind. As you can see, it's quite beefy. It is bolted to the engine with uh, half inch bolts. It uses uh, lugs, threaded lugs, for the propeller, which means it's gonna use, pull a lot of torque through any kind of propeller. Here's the loop that's used for the heater. The uh, tailpipe for the turbocharger the turbocharger itself, as you can see, rather than having long, sometimes fancy looking and people kind of think that's cool, uh, having a lot of like pipes coming off the engine. Well, we don't, can't dazzle you with long stainless steel welded pipes. Uh, we can dazzle you with professional welding, but we also proud of having an integral exhaust manifold with the turbocharger is bolted directly to the engine, there are no external long pipes that can crack and cause uh, failures, cause exhaust to get in the cabin and those kinds of things. So it's very compact. As you can see, the engine has a servo motor that operates the turbocharger wastegate directly. And that's controlled by the computer the computer gets signals from the throttle position sensor, which is on this side of the engine. And depending on where you put the throttle in the airplane, here's the clip where you would put your throttle cable. We use a mechanical throttle that drives this. And what happens is when this is moving back and forth, the throttle position sensor that's built in here, no moving parts, sends a signal to the motor that drives the turbocharger wastegate, controlling it completely automatic at all altitudes and all power settings. So the only control you have in the airplane is the throttle control. Depending on where you put it, depends on how much boost is produced 
through the turbocharger, which then has an outlet where the pressure goes behind the engine and then comes up and into the throttle body on this side. So there is an intercooler and some ducting that is not shown here that gets hooked up into that. Here's that uh, helical starter gear that I mentioned earlier in the video. And the starter motor has a corresponding gear on it. Here's the Nippendenso Japanese made alternator, 40 amps of power that is bolted to the back of the engine running a serpentine belt that you would change on your condition inspection each year. The intake on these engines have been fabricated because the original intake is a plastic intake and it doesn't correspond to the location that we need in the airplane for the outlet to go down to the intercooler. The engine uses the synthetic Zero W20 oil, just like in the car, and you can fly all the way across the country and back without ever using any oil on these engines. Engine mounting brackets are attached to the back of the engine. Here is the original location for the mounting of the engine in the vehicle. From there, an adapter is used and mounting brackets are fabricated in order to line up to a 4130 steel weldment that attaches the engine to the airframe. We have corresponding mounting brackets on the bottom as well. Here's the fuel rail that we talked about. Let's start it at the high pressure pump your fuel will come in from the airplane right here. This is a high pressure pump that is controlled by the ECU to provide the correct pressure for the high pressure fuel rail. And then fuel, like a diesel engine, comes out of the pump and is fed through this high pressure fuel rail into the high pressure injectors. As you can see, they are low on the cylinder head and they fire the fuel directly into the cylinder as needed. Sometimes you think, are these things reliable? And then you kind of go back to thinking, well, I wouldn't buy a Honda Accord engine or Honda Accord car if I didn't think it was reliable. And you don't see these cars or outboard motors sitting along the road anymore. They're extremely reliable. And they don't have any maintenance, not like you do in an airplane. In an airplane, we have maintenance every year. And we have maintenance every time we take the cowling off. We look at everything. So it's a whole different thing than just leaving it underneath the hood of a car and then never looking at it until something fails and then go in and fix it.